everyone, and welcome to our last 2022 Masterclass. Thank you so much for joining us. We're super excited to be with you today, all of you from all over the world. We hope you had lovely weeks and are getting super excited about the upcoming weekend. As a reminder, um, L'Oréal Masterclasses are part of L'Oréal for Youth. We believe at L'Oréal that it's important to be able to transmit via our experts internally some learnings for you as young people who are kickstarting your career. And today, I'm super excited that we have with us Camille, who's just next to me. <laughs> just to present myself super quickly, my name is Reem. I have been in L'Oréal for a few years now. I work in the Global Talent Acquisition Team. And I am extremely excited and honored to be able to host uh, our chief Metaverse and Web3 officer to me today, Camille Prully. So Metaverse, AR, VR, NFTs, blockchain, is this new? Is this hype? I think we're all asking ourselves a bunch of questions on this. And Camille is here today in order to share with us the L'Oréal perspective on this exciting topic. Camille is going to be talking to us for a few minutes, and then we're going to be animating a live Q&A session. So please, throughout the presentation, put your questions in the chat. This is a moment for you to be able to connect with Camille and to really get some insights into this exciting topic. So without further ado, over to you, Camille. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rim. Uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining. I'm super happy and super uh, glad to be with you all today. Thank you for taking the time to uh, to join on this Friday. Um, and I'm looking forward, most importantly, to be able to share with you and to answer all the questions you might have. Uh, so indeed, I'll try to, to keep the presentation and the elements I want to share with you uh, short so that we have the time to, uh, to interact and answer as many questions as possible. Um, so I thought I would start by introducing myself, you know, and where do I come from and um, how I ended up being today in that role of Chief Metaverse and Web3 Officer. Um, just to give you some, some perspective, I come from France, from Strasbourg, so a, a town in the east of France and near to Germany. And I come from an entrepreneur family. Uh, my uh, my grandparents and grand grandparents and dad were in the car business, car dealer business, as you can see on that picture. Um, I grew up uh, being uh, uh, keen uh, about uh, drawing, paintings, about cooking, so uh, everything uh, manual and uh, and artistic. Uh, that's something I liked. And I'm I was not a geek. I cannot say I was a I was a geek, but my mom. Uh, was a math teacher and she was passionate about computers and about technologies. So we had at home one of the first Macintosh and all the, the Apple stuff. We um, we grew up, so the first laptop, then the first internet. I was the first in my class uh, uh, to have internet at home. You know, these were the dates. That's all, all I am. Um, and so that's uh, how I ended up being having this kind of virus uh, about uh, technology and innovations. Um, I did a very, uh, very classic uh, business school study um, in HSA in France. Uh, and uh, I was not the typical girl that would uh, that would apply at L'Oréal. I need to be honest with that. Um, but I was super interested when L'Oréal came and pitched Brainstorm. And I know we have many Brainstormers uh, today with us. So uh, I did the 2003 edition on Biotherm at the time. Um, and actually, it's because I did Brainstorm that I met so many amazing people at L'Oréal that I discovered this energy and passion um, and this entrepreneurial spirit that then I had the opportunity to do an internship. And after this internship, uh, I still worked for a year and a half in startup and then I joined L'Oreal telling myself that I had so many things I could learn and that this entrepreneurial spirit within the company was so uh, interesting that uh, I really wanted to to be part of the company and so that's how my, my, my career started within the group. I started in marketing so I worked on Maybelline, I worked on Elsev uh, and on Air Color both at a, a country level so uh, go to market uh, marketing and uh, operations marketing as we call it and then at the dmi so the dmi that's a marketing development team where you're really in charge of um the brand strategy about the product strategy uh the product launch and, and all the media campaign at the global level so that's where i worked on uh, on hair color um and i was really passionate about the consumer behaviors and um 
consumer insight and how do you build a product that at the end they're going to buy, you know, in, in shelf where there's so many things and you need to stand out. Uh, I was really passionate about that. And then um, sharing everything with you uh, all today, I had, uh, I had a health issue at that time and uh, I had to, uh, to be out of work for, for a few months. And when I came back, I wanted to focus more on the way we were doing marketing and on people. Um, I, I had a purpose at that moment. I wanted to, uh, my purpose was to work more with people. And well, the, the value with L'Oreal is that you can change type of jobs and careers as long as you're passionate. And uh, at that time, I took some jobs in, uh, in upskilling, so in HR, working on transformation and uh, marketing skills. And I ended up being in charge uh, of digital upskilling. It was a role that was created in 2015 when uh, when we had our CDMO or chief digital uh, office that uh, that arrived within the group and uh, I uh, I took the first digital upskilling role within the group at that time um, and then uh, and then actually I did that role for three years three amazing years but I had an entrepreneurial um, project that was uh, uh, that was uh, super uh, uh, strong to to my heart and that I wanted um, to make to come to life so with the support for the group I asked to be able to uh, leave the group and start my own company. So as was in Station F, um, the, the largest uh, worldwide uh, startup accelerator, building my own startup at the time. Um, and it was a super useful learning experience. I learned so much. Long story short, it turned more as a consulting than a startup. Um, and I love project. I love making things at scale with impact. So we were pivoting like every startup, you know. Um, and we were pivoting. And exactly at that time, L'Oreal, uh, which I was still in contact, with and that was a client reach out to me and say okay um if you're interested there's a role we're going to create ar around digital innovation and services so all these solutions that you can build to bring your product to life on the digital space so virtual try on where you have the ability to virtually try your product or hair color try on or skin diagnostic based on ai or hair diagnostic or fragrant fragrance diagnostic and um, it was at the moment we acquired modiface and i jumped on the boat, you know, uh, telling myself that uh, uh, that would be a, a super amazing challenge uh, to be able to uh, to put this solution in, in the market and uh, and bring them to life. And that's how I really started to work on AR, VR, AI, and all the trends. And you see that coming. And I was also in charge of open innovation, so all the link with startup, VCs, and so on. And over the past years, I would say, we've started to see that AR, VR, um, this trend about gaming, uh, about Web3, were growing and growing. We had more and more startups, more and more use case growing. And so we started to work progressively on, on this and what it could mean for L'Oreal. And then it started to accelerate, of course, in the past years. And that's the moment where the group decided to create that position of Chief Metaverse and Web3 Officer. And um, I I was uh, very uh, pleased to be able to take it. So somehow, since the digital upskilling, so it's been uh, since uh, almost seven years, uh, should it be because of my own startup or within the group, whenever I, I, I took a new role, it was a, a creation, a job creation. So each time a, a new role that didn't exist before. Uh, so uh, very excited to be uh, to be able to, uh, to have this kind of uh, challenges, uh, sometimes frightening, but super exciting. So Metaverse and Web3. What does that mean? Uh, where does that come from? Uh, uh, what's the buzz about? That's what we want to discuss today and, and share uh, together. So the first thing I wanted to share is that somehow the concept of metaverse and metaverse, it's not new. Uh, actually, the, the, the term was coined in uh, 1992 um, uh, in, a, in a novel called Snow Crash uh, from uh, Neil Stevenson. Um, and some of you might remember the first uh, metaverse type, like Second, Five, Second Life in uh, 203, or then the emergence of more and more gaming platform and bigger gaming platform that have occurred in the past year. So Roblox in 2006, Roblox is a platform with 200 uh, million active users a month, monthly uh, active users. Then the Oculus, so the first headset uh, that started with Facebook, then the creation of Ethereum in 2015, and so on and so on. 
So over the past years, there are already a lot of pieces that have come together. And in 2021, this is really a moment where we had a tipping point. So remember 2021, just still in the middle of the COVID, where people were craving to be able to meet and connect or to escape the fact that we were all in lockdowns. And that's the reason why virtual platforms and gaming were booming at that time. They were already big, but they really boomed. Um, where also people were craving for utopia, you know, for, for purpose, for new ways of living, of working, of socializing um, that were uh, appearing. Um, it was a moment as well in 2021. It's a moment where we've reached a certain level of tech maturity. 5G, VR, XR, blockchain, sensors, to name a few, um, these technologies are, are becoming at scale and, able, and, and, and available um, for a lot of, uh, of people and for multiple use cases, including for consumers. Then you have also this trend of all the creator economy that is shaping the metaverse and Web3. So all these creators, starting with the influencers on Instagram and creators on Instagram, and these creator, they need to make money. They need to make revenue for, for the creation that they do. And they want the power back. They want, they are the one building strong communities and people that you want that want to connect with them and engage with them. And they are the one shaping the culture of, of Metaverse and Web3. Of course, all the trends linked to virtualization, uh, we already, uh, already mentioned it. And then also in 2021, uh, it's a moment where the level of uh, crypto tokenomics um, has become at a certain level of reach above the 100 million people um, uh, leveraging tokens. So where you start to have a, a sufficient critical mass that is um, using these technologies. And of course, you had Facebook that renamed themselves Meta at that time, and the emergence of, uh, of, uh, of suddenly everything was, was renamed uh, uh, Metaverse at that time. And so the first thing to have in mind is that when you, we say measures, it's very, very linked to um, virtual reality. Virtual reality, augmented reality, as you see in the middle. So uh, you have uh, the real life and an additional layer on it, or the virtual reality where you fully immersed. Uh, should it be with a headset on, on your laptop or on the phone? Um, so it comes from virtual reality and it comes from gaming as well. And just to give you some perspective, there are today five billion people that are online. Uh, there are 3.2 billion people that are gamers. So I don't know how many of you are gamers. I would be super interested to know. Just for you to know gamers, it comes from playing some um, games on your on your phone uh, uh, or um, so uh, the little games, the little apps uh, on your phone like Candy Crush and so on, or the big games like Roblox, Fortnite on your laptop, or even going with uh, headsets and so on. And 45% of the gamers are women. It's not just men. It's not just Gen Z, as we uh, as uh, as we say sometimes, and as we think sometimes. It's 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 almost everyone uh, that is a gamer, and it's a it's a big trend that we have. Then, when you think about crypto, uh, that is also uh, that is more linked to Web three. The crypto, uh, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, the people that own crypto, uh, there's more than three hundred twenty million people today, and it keeps growing. Actually, even if there was a crash, several crash um, over the past month, um, and a lot of speculation, it still keeps growing. It's there, and it will stay. And then you have around 100 pe million people that have wallets. Usually when you have a wallet, you have NFTs, tokens linked to them. I'll explain after what, what it means. So you have these tokens and you don't necessarily need a wallet if you have crypto. So, but when you have a wallet, then you start to engage really within the Web3. So that's, these are really the early adopters of crypto. Again, we'd be super uh, interested to, to know how many of, of you uh, have already uh, tested or, or, or used um, uh, these technologies. And the idea is that uh, uh, it's, it's still super small today, let's be honest, but it's projected to be more than 4 billion uh, in 2025. So almost as many people as the ones that are online. Um, and the thing that we've seen as well is that this gaming platform and the gamers um, are changing the, the usage that they have of the platform. And this gaming platform, they are becoming the new social media. 
Um, and you know, you have this trend where it goes always from one social media to another. To another. It started with Facebook or even MySpace, Facebook, um, then Instagram, then TikTok, uh, right? So everyone is there. What's the next one, you know? And we have lots of indicators that actually gaming platforms are becoming new social media. So um, that's the reason why we are paying attention to them, because actually that's where people are spending time, uh, spending time to play, to interact, to meet people, to socialize, and even to shop today. Um, and that's the reason why we believe gaming is the best representation of what the metaverse will be for now. Uh, it starts really with that, and they're the one with, that will drive the, the adoption. Metaverse, just to share a definition we need at some point, there's so many of them. Um, it's, it's, it's a dream, so it's not free there yet. Um, uh, it's a dream, it's a dream uh, uh, or vision of what could be the next iteration of the internet, maybe in three, five, ten years. Um, and this is the idea of this virtual world, virtual world places that are fully immersive, that are persistent, that exist even if you're not connected to them, that keeps living, where you have a presence, so people, uh, avatars, uh, uh, version of yourself, um, where you meet with a purpose, you know, should it be to uh, play, to socialize, to uh, uh, to uh, learn um, uh, or to work all together, and where you have products. Should it be virtual products like um, skins or goodies to uh, uh, to dress up your avatars, or um, NFTs, or services, or even real products that you can buy then in for for the real life that are part of it? This is the way we define uh, the metaverse. But today, metaverse is mostly the internet in 3D. If I want to give a, a simple definition, and of course, this is really driven by Gen Z. Um, they are not just digital native, they are virtual native as well. Uh, they uh, then when they use avatars to uh, to play in games and they have this ability to customize themselves, we see that um, they sometimes think more themselves uh, within these avatars because then you, you can be wherever you want to be. You can show your soul, not just your outfits. Uh, you can connect with the, the social, uh, you have this connection aspect I've mentioned earlier. And then what we see on this platform that Gen Z have already adopted is this new mechanisms and new uh, monetization model, the play to earn. The more you play, the more you gain points and you're able to have rewards or to buy some stuff. Uh, the, if you create some items like you see here, then you're able to earn money as well. If you engage with a brand or within a platform, same, you are able to earn money. These are new mechanisms mechanisms that we see emerging and that we believe are here to stay. So you'll have the metaverse that is really linked with the, the, the virtualization trends. And then there's these other trends that's complementary and that is interlinked with this, that is the emergence of Web3. So Web3 is the, what is seen again as the next iteration of the internet. Um, uh, Remember Web 1? I'm not even sure you can remember, but I do remember, you know, where Web 1, this is how it looked, uh, basically with uh, pages very slow of content that you could read. Basically, it was a, it was as simple as that. You didn't have Google search. You needed to type the, the address yet. And you had an email on that. And if you wanted to connect to anything, you needed to, uh, to use a username and password. Then in the web two that we are still very much in is the internet of people of things. So, so it's the internet of the GAFAM as well, where you're able to read and write, meaning that you're able to post your own content, to create your own content, to interact. Um, uh, and you use, you can still use your email or username and password, but you are able also to sign in directly, leveraging one of the GAFAM. So Google, Facebook sign in, um, Apple sign in, whatever, but you don't need necessarily to enter your email each time. So that's the era of the Web 2 that we're still in. And progressively, we see this Web 3 emerging where you're able to read, write, and own. In the Web 2, your data, when you interact with a website, they somehow are stocked and um, on the website. They belong to the website. You can still ask for data privacy to erase them, but they're on the website. With the Web3, you have this ability to own your data, meaning that they are on your wallet and you decide what you're going to share with, uh, with whom. Uh, this is this utopia and this vision again of the Web3. And 
whenever you're in the Web3, you are able to connect with a wallet. And this ownership, it's very linked to the blockchain. It's enabled to the blockchain. So this ability to have a chain of blocks where data is stored safely, uh, decentralized, meaning that it can be anywhere. It doesn't depend on a state or a place. Um, and uh, so that's uh, based on the blockchain. And you can have digital assets. Should it be crypto, uh, crypto money, or should it be non-fungible tokens? So digital assets, again, digital collection that you can have on the platform. Um, and what we see is that this digital collectible, this NFT that's, uh, that have been uh, booming uh, in the past months and years, well, there's been some more successful than others. At the end, what's successful is when they have a usage, a utility. Um, and the different utility that we see, I would say, could three of them for brands. The first one are the collectibles. So should it be um, like the sport card that you want to collect um, or uh, this uh, Adidas uh, uh, card that you want to own and you want to be part of the club that owns the digital collectibles. And then sometimes you have, uh, you have also uh, uh, some rewards of having that uh, that card, and you can access some content, you can access some experiences, etc. Then, in terms of non fungible tokens, you have also the wearable one. So, items that you can use to dress up your profile picture or to dress up your avatar, so that are wearables. And what we see as well is this emergence of digital items, meaning that you have the digital, the virtual version, and the real product version, so the real sneaker and the virtual sneaker of it. And you have, again, utility at attached to it. So you're part of a club. You're able to unlock specific experiences, content, information um, that, uh, that are meaningful for, for you uh, because you want to be uh, close to that brand. And when we, what we see, back to the question of does it generate business? Well, if there's a utility, well, it generates revenue for brands. It can be a real stream of revenue. And these are figures that are post NFT crash uh, and post, post crypto crash. So it does generate new revenue for brands if they attach a real utility. So if they bring value to people, it goes back to that each time. And at the end today, uh, when we speak about Metaverse and Web3, um, it's a bit the same question that we have asked ourselves when the internet started or when the social media started. As a brand, how do you show up? Uh, what's your presence going to be like? What are you going to bring uh, to the conversation? Or do you create new growth? You know, is it just an engagement model, meaning that you're able to connect with people, or is it a place where revenue is going to be created and where you, as a brand or as a company, need to look at it to understand if that revenue, these different sources of revenue, will make sense or can even disrupt your company? And then there's a, the question on how do you transform? How do you get organized? What do you, does it mean in terms of skills, of weather working, of future of work? and how it will impact not just your brands, but also the company and the people that work within it. Um, when you say that, then the question comes, OK, but Metaverse and Web3, what does that mean for beauty? Uh, what is it for us? Well, what we think is that uh, Metaverse, I said it's visual. Um, it's about communities. Uh, it's a cultural movement. It's about creative codes as well, with a new creation, new style, new uh, uh, new creators that are emerging. And it's about product and experiences. Well, beauty, it's all about visual, again. It's about self-expression, about how you can express yourself um, with those products. It's about artistry. Um, it's about conversation and connecting with people, socializing. And it's about experiences again. So they are very, very interlinked and some opportunities that we can see for beauty. And so the first thing that we've done in the past month is let's start by asking ourselves some questions of what are the audiences? So what are the web three communities that might be interested in beauty? What is the interest of today beauty community towards Metaverse and Web3? Are they interested or not at all? Um, what's the added value? that our brands, and we have certified within the group, that our brands can bring to Metaverse. Are all our brands uh, fitted to enter uh, this space? Some might be more relevant than others. What are the opportunities that uh, these uh, Metaverse and Web3, this next iteration of, uh, of the web are going to create? 
and what are the risks. And this is a big, uh, a big element. And what does it mean in terms of organization as well? And I say, when I say what are the risks, well, Metaverse and Web3, it's so new that uh, it's the far west. And basically, it's the far west. There's no regulation. Um, and there are many questions, lots of unknown. And there are many questions into it. Many questions in terms of sustainability, in terms of ethic, mental health, in terms of diversity and inclusion, in terms of cybersecurity, in terms of speculation, to name a few. Um, these are just a few of the free, uh, of the risks that it takes. And basically, this is really what within the team keep us awake at night. You know, um, I have a two-year-old uh, daughter, and I want to make sure that in in 15 and 20 years, she doesn't tell me that it was a mistake to take such a job. And when we are at L'Oreal, we're the number one in beauty, and we have strong commitment when it comes to L'Oreal for the future. And we have a responsibility to make sure that the way we explore Metaverse and Web3 is fully in line with the responsibility and the commitment that we are taking on all the rest of the company. So it means that by design, and also because it's the thought, we need to ask ourselves the, the question and to push to have some answers. And that's what we're working on with uh, some external organization, uh, with some uh, think tank group to be able to understand what we know and what we don't know today in terms of this. And um, how do we approach it so that we make sure that what we're going to bring is added value to people. And I really think that um, this metaverse and Web3 can bring value to the real life, not just the virtual one. And that's the reason I actually what our strategy is really to build a friend that is not ju uh, just about consumer journey that would be offline and online, but that would be offline, online, and on-chain, meaning on the blockchain. So um, offline with all our augmented products and services, because again, Metaverse and Web3, that's the future, it's not yet mature. What is ready now is all these technologies leveraging services, leveraging AR, VR, etc. Online with immersive experiences, with community engagement, leveraging the new um, community model that we see emerging. And of course, with some exploration carefully, uh, with a lot of humility on the uh, on the blockchain, where we see opportunities for loyalty on chain, so the future of uh, of CRM, future of community empowerment, thanks to this token, for example. And we believe that it's really about building a journey um, that uh, will be fully consistent and seamless between offline, online, and on chain. At the end, um, offline is evol evolving, online is extending, and on chain is just starting. So it's really about combining these threes. And back to um, to the theme of uh, brainstorm, because I know this, the, this year the theme of brainstorm is about cracking the codes of beauty and Metaverse and Web3 are for sure influencing the next generation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, these codes of beauty. Today, there's so much that can be done with some technology that we have started to use within the group. Um, to give a few examples, for example, we acquired Modifest in 2018, and these services that have the ability to help you virtually try a lipstick or to have your own skin diagnostic um, or to leverage artificial intelligence for personalized recommendation um, uh, with users, this is something super powerful that, uh, that we see emerging and that we are pushing within the group. What we're also working on um, is this new creative visual codes. Whenever you start to, to look at creators within the Web3 and Metaverse, they are shaping a new vision uh, of the world, uh, a new uh, codes uh, of, uh, of uh, artistry, and for, for sure, new codes of beauty. Um, so we are working closely with some 3D artists, CGI artists, to be able to imagine new ways of expressing beauty with no limits, because in the virtual world, we, we don't have these, uh, such limits, sometimes a bit with pixels and so on, but still. And so we're working on really how these creative codes are, 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 are shaping um, uh, the future of artistry, and not just for metaverse, but you know, really also on products, on reproducts, on packaging, packaging and retail. I'm sure if you look at uh, at the uh, holiday season uh, retail stores at the moment, some, and especially in luxury, are very much inspired by metaverse, gaming, et cetera, et cetera. These are shaping really the codes of, uh, of beauty. Some insight for your presentation in brainstorm in the way you're going to choose the visual elements of it. 
Um, and then uh, when we uh, we at the group are starting to explore Metaverse and Web3, we have a very much test and learn approach. Uh, very much test and learn approach and around different angle where we want to really understand what's the value we can bring and what's the best angle uh, to bring value to the consumers. So it could be through virtual worlds that we're using. For example, you see here on the top, um, Matrix or, or um, hair care brand, a professional hair care brand, um, run a education day uh, for hairdresser uh, within a virtual world where they could connect, they could connect on social as well uh, within their device, they could gather they could be trained on uh, the hair artistry and the pros, um, and that was very, very successful. We had as well some experiment with uh, with Lancome uh, on some virtual world in the in China with uh, with the Rose Garden where you can interact and we, where you have a loyalty program. We are very much also on the creators and gamers, such a big audience, uh, the gamers, and so leveraging platforms such as Twitch um, for them or Armani that. Uh, launch a game in Fortnite as well, some speedruns. If you're a gamer, this is really hard to play. So I encourage you to, to test it. Um, all the avatars, uh, I already mentioned it as well, and the virtual experiences. We had a few experiments. For example, the one that you see on the on the bottom with, uh, with Nyx. Uh, where we launch a collection for diversity and inclusion uh, to avatars in partnership with people of crypto that was for Pride Day uh, in June. And then for NFT and digital ownership, where YSL is one of the brands. Uh, so if Saint Laurent is one of the brands that is setting the trends, uh, you know, within the group, um, dressing up for change, and that has launched some NFTs and that is working on their loyalty program. And we have more to come early next year. Stay tuned, stay tuned for that. And the last case that I wanted to share with you is uh, that we've released very recently is that we have uh, launched a partnership with, um, with Ready Player Me on avatars. The reason we've done it is because we see that 100% of the gamers have an avatar. That uh, uh, the projection is that we'll have five to ten avatars uh, in the coming years, and that the way you style your hair and makeup is as important as clothes for avatar. But when it comes to hair, well, there are not that many choices today, not many diversity. So we thought we, we thought we would partner with Maybelline or makeup brand and L'Oreal Professional to actually bring hair and makeup to avatars. Um, and uh, so we br brought that uh, hair and makeup to avatars. So with this uh, this willingness to bring more creativity, more diversity, and more tech expertise for avatars. So if you go on Ready Play Me, you'll be able to test our makeup and hair look. I encourage you to do it. Uh, I have mine on LinkedIn as well. If you if you connect to LinkedIn, you'll see mine uh, as well, my avatar. And then you can use it on more than 4,000 platforms. And so uh, we still a very early stage pilot and we're learning a lot. Um, but it's super interesting, for example, for us to see that the more daring look, the one you see on the right, are actually the one that perform the most, that people are the more eager to be able to to, uh, to use. So that's one of the exciting projects we work on uh, recently. Um, and just a, a, a few words to tell you that uh, today we have very small, small team working on, on Metaverse and Web3 at the, at the central level. But actually, how we've we have been able to do uh, a lot of experimentation and test and learn and how we are learning everywhere on that journey is because within the group, we've uh, we have spotted expert and passionate people that have learned about Metaverse and Web3 by themselves. And that uh, we started to connect and discuss with them. And we decided to cover, to uh, connect all together into what we call the Metaverse. So it's our own uh, Web3 internal community, you know. And we are meeting monthly. We are on Discord. We are meeting on Teams, extra to be able to share uh, learnings, inputs, what we see happening and insight that we see happening on the market, where ideas of what we could do uh, internally for our brands. And with this willingness to build a responsible, scalable, profitable, and sustainable and fun metaverse and web free. And these people, they come from all over the place, I would say everywhere within the group, different jobs, different level of seniority, uh, from uh, legal to uh, commerce uh, to marketing. And it's amazing to be able to see that they contribute on top of their job and that uh, uh, we have this, uh, this metaphors uh, working with us today. 
And before I hand over to questions, because I see time is running and I want to make sure we have time to interact, I just wanted to share with you um, some what I've learned along this, this journey of uh, uh, so many different jobs and, and opportunities and what I learned really from my mentors that really um, uh, helped me to uh, uh, to dare and uh, and uh, and take new challenges in time. Um, the first one is uh, to understand where you in so when your energy comes from. Um, um, there's so much happening. There's so much things we need to do uh, that can be stressful when you launch a fully new project that you have no benchmark and no idea if it can work. Super important to see where your energy comes from, how you can recharge. And at the same time, when you're working, where there are these moments where you don't even realize your work because you're so passionate and that's what you're the best at. So I really encourage you to uh, check within your personal and, and pro-life, professional life and student life, what are these moments of energy where you feel you you you, you can do anything uh, because that's that's a, an amazing indication of where you will be able to perform best and then another the second advice i was given at some point is that um a focus on on making your strength even stronger uh, sometimes you have this willingness of improving improving what you're not good at. Uh, it's the contrary that you need to do. Uh, what you're not good at, you'll never become the top. Take your strength and make it to the top. That's how you will become really uh, somebody uh, unique that will have value. Uh, and actually, you will feel so much um, powerful and have so much impact if you focus on your friends. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, something to do. Uh, then I'm, I'm an obsessed learner. I keep learning all the time and I, I really think that uh, especially because the, the world is moving fast that uh, this learning agility is something we should keep uh, even after being a student uh, I believe in the always on students somehow um, and then uh, trust people you who know you as well um, uh, each time in my previous job or even when I started a company uh, there were there's so much moments of doubts where you don't know if you're gonna make it if you if the job is too big if you're going to be able to achieve it and when your mentors and people know that know you tell you i'm 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 confident you can do it that you're gonna be able to uh, to do it then well they know you better so forget about uh, about your 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 doubts and go for it and focus on uh, on doing the work and working hard and then you you see you are able to to move mountains um and the last point is that whenever we worked on this project and just such as metaverse and web3 we need to onboard so many different people you know from legal from tax from it and then you could think oh that's going to be a challenge well no it all depends on the way you do it um if you basically share one common goal if you onboard them not just on their little part but if you share with them the vision and ask them to contribute to the whole vision that's how you um you you are able to uh, to transform and to have one common vision and one team and that's actually the best thing uh, and one of my source of energy is to be able to work with so many diverse people within the team with so many background uh, uh, and that's the magic and how we make a project happen i would say and that's uh, that's the key element I wanted to to share with you today. And uh, no, our motto within the group is "Metaphors be with you." Mm -hmm. So I share that motto with you, uh, especially for 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 the brainstormers that are starting to work on their project. And now I shut up and I answer questions, <laughs> <laughs> and I stop to share my screen. Correct. Thank you so much, Camille. I personally have learned so much. I can confirm to you that I have no knowledge of Web One. <laughs> very young um it's true i mean your presentation was so inspiring thanks so much and it's true that it's very much today a test and learn environment just like you mentioned and it's important to have humility when we talk about such exciting topics uh you 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 called it a far west which i thought was extremely uh, interesting i think i also agree with you a lot about the idea of always going back to the why you know yeah. with everything we do we always try to go back to the why find utility in what we're doing and actually i would love to kick off the q a with uh, a question related to this 
We have a question that is uh, basically asking, do you think the metaverse is really a growth opportunity or just a new marketing strategy for brands? I would love to hear your point of view on this. But that's the golden question, I would say. That's the golden question. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer, to be honest. Um, I do believe that at the end, it all goes back to, uh, to uh, what's the usage and the utility that we are bringing. If it's just a bit of marketing strategy, it will stay that. If you manage to bring u u real utility to people, then I believe it can be a game changer. And it will depend also on the, about the tech maturity uh, and what you'll be able to do with it. Uh, for example, if you are able to uh, learn uh, uh, and meet, uh, for example, uh, some experts that you wouldn't have the opportunity to meet in real life, then it can it can add some uh, added value if it can uh, bring some new experience. If you think, for example, about fragrances, fragrances. Whenever you discuss with a, with one of fragrance marketer, he will describe his fragrance as a whole universe. You know, with all uh, images that he has in mind. Thanks to metaverse, is able to showcase them and immerse you within that environment. And that's, um, that can be super, uh, uh, super lovely as an experience and super immersive as an experience. Then you discover a full new universe. So it really depends on, on the added value that brands are going to be able to create. Of course. Thanks so much, Camille. Super clear. Um, I think we have an interesting question that you touched upon a bit, but maybe your personal take on this. What are the biggest challenges that you see in the metaverse today? Uh, there are a lot. Um, there are a lot. The first, uh, the first one I would say is not to um, take the tech for the tech. You know, you always have these trends whenever there's a new technology where uh, all the people suddenly behave like uh, ducks. You know, they they run uh, and they follow uh, the the duck mother uh, all over the place, and they want to uh, to uh, follow the trend and do the trend for the sake of doing the trends. We need a metaverse project. And then uh, you you do not you do nonsense project. It's not about the tech. It's really about I want to do something for people for the consumer. And by the way, maybe metaverse or Web three can be actually a real game changer to make that come to life. So I would say that's when we frame a strategy. That's one of the the first challenge that we have. Then there are all the risks uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier linked to metaverse and Web three because it's unregulated. Uh, so as uh, as a self within the company, we we apply some rules that we hold already have on data privacy, on the, on the ethics that we have for everything, even if uh, from a government perspective they're not there, um, because the specificity of metaverse and Web three is that it's global. It's not linked to any country and, and regulation. For example, if uh, if uh, something happened within a metaverse, which law apply? Is it the US or the French one? Well, if you're US citizens, but then if the company it's a French one, how does that work? There's so many, so many questions to tackle. Um, that as brand, we need to be very careful to make sure, uh, again, we don't do it just for the tech and for the sake of doing innovation, and that we are very mindful about uh, the impacts of what we do. I think that's one of the, the big challenges that we have as well. Thanks, Camille. Let's move on to maybe a more um, grand storm question. <laughs> uh, somebody is asking, I would like tips to stand out and succeed in L'Oréal Brandstorm 2023. Maybe something related to your own experience, Camille, when you participated in Brandstorm, what you can share with the, what can you share with the audience? You mean as an advice or? Yes. Um, uh, haha. Oh, live, use the Laurel people as much as possible. First, uh, they can <laughs> they can give you some uh, some and your teachers, you know, um, they can give you so much advice on the way to shape your presentation. And uh, I would say it, it sounds obvious, uh, but put consumer at the center again. Don't do tech for tech. Put consumer at the the center. So think you as user. Would you do it? And would people really do it? Or just is it just gimmicky? And how can you leverage something that would be at scale? I, I mentioned a lot about Metaverse and Web3, but as we say, it's still very much early stage. Some things are more mature than others. Gaming, AR, VR, AI. Uh, don't go just for the most innovative one. Also, you can be very innovative with technologies that are already quite mature. Super. Can you talked a lot in your, I mean a lot. You talked in your presentation. 
<laughs> let's not exaggerate. You talked in your presentation about the values that are uh, the values and the ethics behind the metaverse and Web3 and all this new exciting topics that we're talking about. We have a couple of questions that touch upon this a bit. Somebody was asking, how do we make sure that everybody in the world has equal access to the metaverse? Somebody else was saying, gaming is not always a safe, safe space where you often are, uh, you often encounter misbehaviors from some players. How is Oyal playing an active role in protecting the community and making sure that those ethical questions are actually asked? How is L'Oreal impacting um, the, the playing field, I would say, in this new topic? Um, that's a very good question. So the first thing is to make sure that uh, we choose the platform where we're going. Some are safer than others. Um, so that's the, the, the first thing we do is being careful about the platform where, where we, uh, we interact as, uh, with, uh, with users. Then we have a very strict rules of making sure we don't do uh, weapon games, you know, violent games. That's not, uh, that's not our interest and we, we don't believe... Uh, uh, well, that's uh, that's again. That's where you have lots of uh, violent violence and misbehaviors. And then we're working closely with the platform themselves to make sure that um, they have protection rules, more and more protections and uh, ability to uh, for people to uh, to report and uh, and share uh, problems if there's any on the platform. Uh, and we're starting to do some checklists as well uh, within the group so that we make sure that our projects and our brands, again, we have a few ones on, on these platforms, um, uh, do ethics by design. Again, should it be also making sure that we have diversity? So I would say there's a couple of things with external and internal directly with our brands, but also with the platform um, because this uh, this problem is not uh, linked to us, huh? it exists. So, uh, so uh, to help influence it, that's the way we approach it. And there's still a long way to do. Thanks, Camille. Interesting question. I mean, all the questions are interesting. And by the way, I just want to take uh, five seconds to thank you, all of you, for your amazing engagement. I forgot to mention this before we started the Q&A, but I can see that you are from everywhere in the world, even countries where it's extremely early. So thanks so much for the excitement in the Q&A and the excitement that you're all the love that we feel with Camille. Camille, the metaverse is a whole new world and we're entering another dimension that is extremely dynamic. For brands like L'Oréal Paris, for example, how challenging do you think it will be to remain relevant and yet stay exclusive? You mean in the metaverse or in general? I would, I mean, I'm understanding the question with you, but I would say more in the metaverse when they start to play in this field. But I think, and it's true for every brand, you need to, to be very, very clear about your brand values, what your brand stands for, what's the purpose of your brand, and then find the way to express it and to translate it. What does it mean um, in the social media, you know? What does it mean in the metaverse? What does it mean in the real life, in store? And how do you make sure you have consistency across what is the real world, in the digital world, and the, and the virtual world? So it's, it goes back to having a very, very brand sense of purpose uh, that you need to keep uh, uh, making evolve um, uh, so that people connect with it, but very strong sense of purpose and consistency in the way you approach it. I guess going back to the why, as always. Yeah. Why we do things and what, what do we stand for? Kemi. Let's go towards a more personal question to move away <laughs> a bit from the from the technical questions. We'll get back to them, don't worry. What is the most important thing that you have learned whilst working at, for L'Oréal? And what was the most exciting project you worked on when you were with the marketing team? We have Charlotte asking this. So uh, I, it's super hard to choose one thing I've uh, I've learned. I mean, I shared a few already. Uh, I shared a few already. Um, I think um, I, I think one of the things I've learned at L'Oréal uh, is that uh, there is no limit. Uh, there is no limit in the project you want to make. Uh, as long as you uh, own your ID and that you want to shape it, you can really push it to, to the next level. And usually you yourself putting some limits. Uh, and the company is ready to uh, to go forward and support you more. So don't put yourself limits, uh, push it to the next level. And actually you'll see you're able to make it. That's the, the one of the beautiful thing when you're in marketing. Um, and when, uh, one of the best uh, marketing projects I've worked on, 
Yes. Okay, Casting Creme Gloss was a, an amazing, uh, it was on hair color. Uh, that was an amazing project and an amazing brand uh, to be part of that story and to be able to launch. Um, it's a hair color that gives you amazing shiny hair. And there's a, there's a cream within the box that makes your hair uh, smell so good that it gets people addictive, uh, actually, to that smell. Um, and I love hair color. I've loved working on hair color because it's a very technical uh, product. Mm -hmm. You remember, like, cooking. So uh, for me, the hair color is a bit... The, the, there's a lot of cooking when you mix colorants and, and, and cream so that at the end, uh, the color that's on the box needs to look the same on your hair. So it's a real technical and, and chemical challenge. It's a, a real challenge in terms of consumer insight and how do you give information to the consumer, in, in, the consumer really needs to trust you to put that hair color that's going to stay six to eight weeks uh, on his head, you know. So there's a question of trust that you build. There's a question of uh, sharing uh, tips on how do you apply it so that they look good. Um, so I really enjoy working on that project that is uh, uh, maybe a little, a little bit uh, less uh, sexy than other makeup projects. Mm -hmm. But at the end, I mean, the impact it has on people's life, well, you want your hair color to be right, you know, so I really loved working on on that and uh, and uh, for the complexity it represents. Thanks so much, Karin. We have a question that I really want to take from Hafsa, and I'm really sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name in the right way. So Hafsa is asking, do you have any advice for a college student who's trying to get a job with L'Oréal, but also trying to be successful in the technical field, which today is extremely male dominated? We need more women in the field. <laughs> Uh, and I have a lot of women within my team, and I'm super proud of that. So first, um, uh, first, it's an advantage also to be a woman into that field. So uh, keep learning, learn by yourself, you know, test, learn the platform, build your own edge. And you'll see that actually people will be interested in your profile because we need diversity. Uh, people need diversity. We need uh, we need all the diversity uh, uh, of point of view. So uh, I would say it's a, it's it's actually a competitive advantage for you to be interested in tech. So go for it, full in, learn. And when it came to apply to L'Oreal, well, I think joining Brainstorm is the the best advice I, I could uh, I could give you if you're part of the targets. Um, and otherwise, to connect with people, connect with the company. Uh, uh, understand the, the brands are they working uh, so you're doing your own uh, you know uh, uh, watch uh, of the of the brand um, and uh, looking at again at the consumer behaviors understanding the consumer and trying to uh, decipher the consumers uh, then when you'd be in interviews uh, being able to uh, to share the way you understand the consumer is a is a super powerful weapon as well 100% Hafsa saying that I said her name right, so I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> Thank you so Congrats. much for the feedback. <laughs> okay. Um, Camille, is L'Oréal considering working with one of the biggest XR companies, or are we doing this all with our own resources? What's oh. the plan with this? Um, very good question as well. Um, when it comes to this innovation, especially in tech, we cannot do everything alone by yourself. Uh, it's very willing to open innovation. And the more you want to uh, to innovate and go beyond your calm, you know, business model, um, you need to partner with the best. Uh, so we have we are building our own uh, ecosystem of, uh, of uh, partners, uh, should it be in gaming, in XR, in VR, um, all over the world. And uh, this is strategic. Forest. This is a, a, a huge part of uh, of my time to be able to find the right partners and then to be able to uh, to to find the right partnership to be able to share with the brands. Thanks so much, Camille. I have so many questions. I'm trying to choose, but honestly, I'm sorry because I think some of you will unfortunately not get your answers. We only have seven minutes left, but I'm I'm doing my best to try to tap into uh, different kinds of questions. Um, there's an interesting, uh, a bit of a prospective question, I would say, uh, to you, Camille. What limitations do you see with the metaverse now, which we talked about, but what limitations do you think could arise in the future when we talk about the metaverse? Some limitation. Um, uh, you have the... The tech limitation again, huh? if uh, if uh, you see some of the 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 
the virtual uh, environments where uh, the rendering and the way it looks and the speed of the internet is not that good. Uh, you could have the limitation of access for people. Um, again, huh, if you don't have access to to internet and, and uh, uh, if you don't find the right model. And then it, it comes back really to the utopia of the web and this vision of the web. How much will it say um, uh, this vision of decentralization versus new giants that will own the business and dictate their rules um, and that will limit uh, some of the developments. One of the key points that we see is we're speaking a little bit about the interoperability uh, between the platform and this ability for one platform to another to be able to connect. Yeah. This is one of the vision. If it doesn't come to life, then it will limit the metaverse for sure. Then I would say it, it's going to be uh, the internet and uh, it will stay as we see today some virtual world and 3d but not you having the ability to have your own avatars and go from one place to, to port it from one place to another or to have communities that can meet in different platforms and automatically get connected um, and recognize themselves so this interoperability in terms of tech i think that's one of the limitations if it doesn't happen and it will take time it won't be easy if it doesn't take time, it will um, it will for sure limit uh, the development of the metaverse. For sure. Camille, maybe um, a question that is a bit further away from the metaverse and more into AR VR. How can we balance between real beauty products and the AR VR? Some people get disappointment when they don't have the effect of AR VR in real life. So it's um, it's a very good question. I think it uh, it all goes back to uh, the realistic aspect of uh, AR and VR. You have different type of usage of AR and VR. If you have the realistic one, for example, if I do a virtual try on uh, on one of our website for a lipstick and then I buy the color, it should be the same. And if it's not the same, it's because we haven't done our job right and we need to recalibrate the shades. So if you've seen some of it, we keep improving it, but tell us if that's the case. Otherwise, the feedback that we have is that it's actually very good. And what we see from the figures is that it limits return uh, when people buy online, because actually they are they are they are more confident and they are rather pleased by the color that they see that looks uh, like the one they've tried. Mm. Um, so less return, so uh, good for the planet as well. So um, that's where you have the the realistic aspect of it. When you have the, the the VR, it can be that's the beauty of it. Actually, it can be anything, and you don't necessarily need. Uh, you can imagine different forms, different aspects. You can, uh, for example, you could imagine that tomorrow you put a lipstick, and suddenly uh, in front of a camera, it, it comes to life, it changes colors, etc. Things that Formula Today can do. Uh, these are these are actually opening new opportunities. Super. Camille, we also received in the chat a lot of questions about recruitment, which is super good news for me and for Camille. Uh, you are, a lot of you are asking about how you get recruited at L'Oréal, how you get internships, how you get graduate jobs, whether we have opportunities only for young people or for older candidates. Of course, we have opportunities for everybody and we have opportunities everywhere. The, unfortunately, the short, quick answer to you all is please do visit our careers website and connect with our recruiters online in order to understand from one, one market to another, what is the offer that we have and what's the best way to integrate the company. Uh, I do have one final question for you, uh, Cami, that it's, it's a bit related to this. What kind of profiles do you, 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 you touched, touched upon, upon it a bit, a bit in, your in your presentation, but can you give us a bit more information on the profiles that you have in your team? I have a very diverse team, a small team, but very, very diverse. Uh, I have an entrepreneur. I have a, a, someone that comes from the gaming industry. I have someone that comes from startup uh, world. Um, I have someone that comes from marketing at L'Oreal, a very uh, more traditional background um, within the group. So I have very, very different uh, uh, profile uh, with one common, uh, common, I would say, uh, aspect and is that they're all passionate and they are all learners uh, addict, so they keep learning every day. Uh, and that's how they discover the topic. And what I mentioned is that um, beyond my small team, 
uh, I've had this opportunity to be able to uh, work with the community of what we call the metaphors, so all the passionate people within the group that have been their own knowledge about crypto, about wallets, about NFT, about AR, generative AI, big trends at the moment, um, uh, and that we are interacting with. And that's the beauty of it is that, again, that's so many different profiles. Uh, and that we uh, that actually, if you, uh, you're you getting recruited and you're passionate about the topic, I'll be happy to uh, to have uh, the opportunity to uh, to work with you all thanks so much Camille thank you it's been so inspiring um we unfortunately have only one minute left so I wanted to take this minute to let you all know first of all to thank you so much for being with us and thank you so much Camille for your presence for your generosity generosity and clarity I think we all learned a lot today mm -hmm.